So today we are talking about extremely basic Christianity. I will admit that by the time we get done, it may not seem extremely basic. There is a danger in having me address any topic. Um, however, I keep coming back to this question because people keep raising these sorts of questions. They either have trouble understanding exactly what it means to be saved or what they're supposed to be saved from, or perhaps why God thinks he has any business telling us what we ought to do or why. You may say that that sounds like a pretty arrogant question, but I actually think it's a pretty honest question. And a lot more people ask it than are willing to say so out loud. More than that, though, there's the question of what comes after. What exactly is our status before God after we're saved? And that's actually a pretty common question and a pretty difficult one for many that doesn't really need to be. So let's get started. I think a lot of people would start this discussion with John 3.16 or possibly the verses we collectively term the Roman road. And we may very well discuss those in due course. However, the proper place to start is actually Genesis 1-1. Genesis, of course, is the first book in the Bible, and 1 is the first chapter of the first book, so that's a pretty good place to start anything. Genesis 1-1 says simply, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We could start more simply, in the beginning God. God exists apart from and above, outside of the universe he has created, outside of the constraints of time. God is the creator of all that is. Now, some of you might uh, want to get into an argument about evolution versus creation or the Big Bang, which interestingly enough right now is actually under some discussion among physicists as to whether the new James Webb telescope shows uh, that perhaps the Big Bang didn't even happen. Some of you uh, may want to chase any number of rabbit trails on this. Just drop all that right now. I said this is extremely basic Christianity. All of those discussions are about how. Our discussion today is about who. In the beginning, God. God is the creator. He created everything, literally everything, including you. As a result of that, God is the owner. He owns literally everything. No different than if you invented uh, some kind of software or some kind of airplane. You would own a patent on that. You would own the rights to your creation. If you were to go out and build a building uh, in the middle of a field, you would own the building because you had invested the capital and the labor and, and the time and the effort, and it would be yours. Likewise, God is, by virtue of being the creator, the owner. By virtue of being the owner of all that is, he is the king. Only God is the king. There might be sub-kings. We might call them kings. We might call them queens. We might call them presidents. We might call them prime ministers. We might call them all manner of other things. But there is one king, the king of kings, God alone. God is both transcendent and immanent. Transcendence is, he, he is above and separate from the creation. There are uh, many, many religions and philosophies in the world that posit some form of chain of being, some idea of, of a god or gods who are continuous with and part of the creation or the created realm. That is not our God. That is not the God who created all that is. The God we know, Jehovah, 
the Father, is transcendent. He is above all things. He is beyond all things. He is separate from all things. The Creator is not a creature. We're going to talk about the Trinity, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who are all one. One God, but three expressions of, of the same person, three persons within what we call the Trinity. God in three persons is nevertheless in no part created. Jesus, when he came to this earth, is not a creature. He is holy man, yes, but holy God. God is apart from the creation. That matters. Why? Because if he is a part of creation, he is subject to whatever binds created things. But God is not bound by anything whatsoever. He is infinite. He is omnipresent, which means he can literally be everywhere. Uh, he is omnip omnipotent, we say, or omnipowerful. He, he has all power whatsoever. He is transcendent. He is also immanent. Immanence, not imminence, which would suggest it's, it's urgent, it's, it's about to happen. No, no, no. This is immanent. He is with us. You hear at Christmas time the name for Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Immanence. He is not merely transcendent, which, which is where the deist would stop. He's the cosmic clockmaker who, who creates the clock, winds it up, and, and it just runs. And, and he is apart from it and takes no interest in it. No, no, no. That is not our God either. God is imminent. He is very interested in his creation. He is very interested in his creatures. He is a personal God. We do not posit cosmic impersonalism, but rather cosmic personalism. He is an active owner. He is an active king. He cares deeply about all of his creatures. He sees the sparrow fall. He counts the hairs on your head. He is not merely God Almighty. He is a father. And he casts himself as a father. He depicts himself as a father. He describes his activity as that of a father for those who come to him. He is simultaneously a judge for those who do not. Now, he will judge the living and the dead. There is a final judgment at the end of time, because time is not permanent. Time is finite. Time is uh, very much uh, possessed of a beginning and of an end. God has created it for his sovereign purpose, and he will dispense with it in due course. At the end of that time, there will be a judgment for the living and the dead. All who have ever lived will stand before the great white throne and be judged once and for all based on their deeds. It is a real and present opportunity for some and threat to others. And for those for whom he is a father, it is the point at which they will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And for those who do not come to him, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, and they will be cast into the lake of fire. Say, so, well, that's really harsh, Rod. What on earth are you talking about lakes of fire for? I'm talking about truth. Because the, the crucial point here when we're talking about God is that he is God, and you are not, and neither am I. He alone gets to make the rules. He alone is the lawgiver. He alone decides what is right and wrong. There can be no appeal from him because he alone is the final arbiter, the final judge, the final everything. So that brings us back to Genesis. We discover in Genesis 3 that man fell. What, is, what do we mean by that? Well, man was placed 
in, into God's creation. God created man and woman last, and, and they are, in many respects, the very high point of God's creation. Uh, they are uh, intended to enjoy God forever, and they are his delight as well. Man and woman, we'll speak of them collectively as man, because that is the colloquialism of the last thousands of years. Uh, so forgive me if you're offended in any way by that. Man stood before God in a state of moral perfection and rebelled. Now, we see that detailed in Genesis chapter 3. We see the results of that from Genesis chapter 3 all the way uh, to the end of the Bible. Uh, we, we see that it is not just Adam and Eve, though. Uh, we discover, um, if we haven't already, and you should read all the way through your Bible every single year, you, you will be amazed at all you discover when you do that, and you should read it cover to cover like a book, not a dictionary. You shouldn't be jumping around. You should actually read it understanding that like a novel or like a textbook, it builds on itself with every additional chapter, and, and you are misunderstanding things if you are treating it like an encyclopedia instead of the greatest work that has ever been produced. And, by the way, the only one that has ever been produced by the Holy Spirit of God himself. So, so we discover throughout Scripture, but let's, let's jump to that Roman road. In Romans 3.23, we are told that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Man rebelled. Now, sometimes we treat sin like a childish word. You know, there are crimes that that's bad, uh, evil that's that's bad. Uh, but but sin that sounds like something you heard when you were uh, in kindergarten Sunday school. It doesn't sound very serious. It sounds like you know something that your mother nagged you about when you were a child. It's exactly the opposite. Sin is a special class of crime. It is specifically a rebellion against the ultimate king, the king of kings, the god of the universe, the creator of all that is, the owner of you. So, so we have to understand that sin, uh, which, is, which is something we're all guilty of uh, individually, but which we share in collectively. When, when Adam fell, you know, his wife Eve was deceived, but Adam knew exactly what he was doing. And he was, he was uh, the covenant head of, of all of humanity as it existed at that time, and then of his children, and then they of their children, and so forth. So, so mankind federally sinned in Adam, and we individually sinned sin in our own deeds, and no one has ever lived a perfect life on this earth except Jesus Christ alone. So, so what do we call this, this sin? Well, honestly, it's best called treason. Now, you know, if I, if I go out and I, I speed on the interstate, and I probably will at the very next opportunity, uh, I might get pulled over and given a ticket. And that's a misdemeanor, and, and not a terribly serious one, I hope. Um, if I go out and I kill a man, well, that's a capital crime, and I would hope that the state of Florida would, would execute me for that. We shouldn't have murderers running around threatening innocent people. But when, say, hypothetically, I go out and I, I betray uh, the United States to a foreign power, well, we have a special word for that. It, it's treason. I have, I have betrayed a rightful sovereign. Well, likewise, when we're dealing not with a king or, or the state, but the king of kings, he who is sovereign over all men and all nations, when we're talking about that, what we're really talking about is treason. So when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit 
in the garden, which they were prohibited from doing. It was the only thing they were told not to do, and of course they went and did it, just like you and I probably would have. It's not a small thing. I mean, the, the violation itself might very well have been relatively small. But we have to think of the violation in different levels. There's, there's the violation itself. You know, when, when Benedict Arnold talks to John Andre, the British officer uh, that he is, he is committing treason with, the act of talking is not treason. The act of telling him things in and of itself would not be wrong. It's the content of what he's telling John Andre, what John Andre is telling him to go do, and his then plot to betray the United States by handing over the fort at West Point to the British that is the treason. The individual pieces are right or wrong on their own merits on a certain level, but there's a, there's a bigger thing going on. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. What they're really doing is betraying the rightful sovereign, in that case, the United States of America. In the case of God, of course, we're, we're betraying the king of kings. Well, that's a problem. So, what is the rightful punishment for treason? Well, rightful punishment for treason is execution. And that's exactly what we see in our relationship with God. Uh, you understand, when I say relationship here, I'm talking about the relationship that any person has, regardless of whether uh, they uh, accept Jesus Christ as Lord of their life or not. You know, whoever you are, you have a relationship toward the Lord. You just may not acknowledge it. It may not be a good relationship, but oh, you relate to him. Your day is coming one way or another. So that relationship is breached. That transgression is treason. And the only possible legitimate way to treat a traitor is death. Every nation acknowledges this all through history. Everyone acknowledges this. What else uh, would you do with a traitor? There, there's, uh, this is someone who has not only uh, betrayed the sovereign, he, he's betrayed all of his fellow man. Sin must be understood separate from sins. A specific act may or may not be all that big a deal. It might very well be the speeding ticket. It might very well be a white lie to your mother when you're eight. But seen at a different level as treason against the king, it is a very, very grave thing indeed. Let's take that another way. If you're talking about the individual act the speeding ticket well uh, that's that's a specific violation but we need to look at it as as the law as a whole you know paul talks about this in in the book of romans quite a bit you know that that I have not merely transgressed a law, but the whole of the law. And, and by the way, we'll get to this in a minute, but when I seek to keep the law by works, because I have already sinned, you know, again, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I, I'm already a traitor. So, so if I'm trying to keep the law through my good works, I'm going to, very quickly find that that's a dead end because the truth of the matter is I have violated the law as a whole and that violation cannot really be paid for apart from the shedding of blood. So what happens at that point? What, what hope is there for us? 
This is actually a pretty grave situation we find ourselves in. It is literally a position of damnation in the in the strict and, and technical sense of that word. And it's not something we can get ourselves out of. That is why God sent, there's John 3.16, his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, or at least need not perish, because what we have in Christ is what theologians call the penal substitutionary atonement. Penal as in penitentiary, penal system. Substitutionary as in in our place. Atonement as in paying for all of the evil whatsoever we have done. Now that is why you will sometimes hear all of this talk about Christianity referred to as the good news. Because the fact of the matter is, it is incredibly good news indeed. There is nothing I can do to atone for my sins. I can be punished for them, not just in death, but in hell. But I cannot atone for them. Because what we see in God's law, and, and someday, if you haven't already, you should actually sit down and read all of God's word, as I said earlier, and that will include the law, which is largely contained in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we see that there is an entire sacrificial system that God gives as a foreshadowing of better things to come to the Jews. The sacrificial system makes absolutely clear that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. It's, it's just a fancy way of saying what I said earlier. Traitors have to be executed. But Jesus comes into the picture, the only begotten Son of God. Begotten means natural, like, you know, if, if uh, you and your spouse have a child. Uh, that's begotten. That's uh, to be distinguished from adoption. An adopted child is not a begotten child. So that's why that's why you see in John three sixteen uh, only begotten son. Because we later learn that those who are reconciled to the Father through the shed blood of Christ are actually adopted as sons and daughters. Yeah, that's going to be very important. We're going to come back to that in a moment. But the only begotten Son of God, who is also God, and, and we're, we're going to belabor that uh, just a bit. Uh, we're, we're told explicitly uh, in, in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Uh, we, we jump ahead to verse 9. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It says, uh, starting in 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John the Baptist bore witness about him and cried out, uh, This was he of whom I said he comes, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. Truth, I 
suppose, uh, will just stand on its own. You need something uh, a little more than extremely basic Christianity if we're going to talk about Pilate's question, what is truth? But grace is another matter. Grace is the concept of unmerited favor. What does that mean? A favor I didn't merit, or to put that another way, didn't darn. Grace is something you get that you don't deserve. Now, remember that Roman road, we jump ahead to, to uh, Romans 6.23, and it says, uh, but the wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is uh, eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, uh, the free gift, that's grace. Grace is what you get that you don't have coming. Whereas, of course, what you have coming is something, at this point, pretty terrible indeed. Treason must be punished. So, Christ came and spent some time, um, 33 or so years, um, living a sinless life, uh, which is an extraordinary thing. But we know from the law that only, only spotless uh, animals, perfect uh, animals, you know, and no animal is exactly perfect, but I said this is a foreshadowing of better things to come. Uh, you know, an, only an unblemished animal could be sacrificed uh, for an offering uh, in, in the temple. Well, Jesus was actually sinless. Jesus was actually perfect. And, you know, this is, this is not merely because he was fully God. It is because as fully man also, he actually obeyed the Father. He's the only person ever to do so. And having done that, and having spent some time teaching and, you know, developing the lives of some disciples and, and all the different things that he did here, he then voluntarily went to the cross and died a, a horrible death. If you've ever seen Mel Gibson's uh, Passion of the Christ, you, you have a sense of just how breathtakingly awful uh, the torture and execution of Jesus was. But it, it's important for you to understand uh, less the horrific nature of all of that from a physical perspective than the judicial nature of it. The cross was a form of execution used by the Romans for non-citizens. A Roman citizen could not be put on a cross. Second, it was the sort of death reserved for traitors and thieves and murderers, truly wretched people, people they didn't like. And of course, you know, I said traitors, rebels. The cross was the epitome of everything we deserve and the exact polar opposite of anything this one singular, spotless, sinless man deserved. Jesus literally paid it all. In one Act, Jesus actually bore upon himself all of the sins of the world, all of the sins of all of his people. He paid the price, no different than if uh, you were a defendant in a courtroom and uh, the judge is sitting up there and finds you guilty and then walks down from the the you know his his place and and writes a check to the bailiff paying your fine completely because it turns out that the judge is also your father Jesus paid the price for our sin and in so doing actually redeemed us. Redeem is a slave word. It, it it literally means buying someone out of slavery. We were in bondage to sin and death, and Jesus redeemed us from it. Now, what happens from there? It's not just 
a penal substitutionary atonement. There's that big $5 phrase again. It's not just redemption. Because at that point, Jesus has bought us. I mean, literally bought us out of slavery. We could just be his slaves. And there's language in the New Testament that describes us that way. Paul Paul certainly repeatedly refers to himself, depending on the translation, as either a slave of Christ Jesus or a bondservant of Christ Jesus. And, and that's a good way for us to think of ourselves. We are his property, not least because he created us in the first place. And I want to be his property. I don't want to be the property of Satan. I don't want to be the property of, of some other master. I want to be his but he didn't stop at that. He actually makes us his friends and his brothers and sisters. Scripture teaches us that he is the first fruit of many brothers. And he, of course, the only begotten Son of God, is then accompanied by countless so numerous as, as to compare to the sand of the seashore and the stars in the sky, countless brothers and sisters redeemed and adopted by the Father. We are called, repeatedly in Scripture, co-heirs with Christ. Now, you understand, this doesn't mean God's going to die and we're going to get his stuff. That, that's not the point. The point is that the heir to a father is his, his most prized, uh, beloved descendant, child, the apple of his eye, and has special rights that no one else has with regard to that father. Well, likewise, Jesus is the Son of God, the only begotten. And when Scripture says that we are co-heirs with Christ, it means that God has actually put us on a level that is with him. Now, he is still first among us by far. He is still our Lord. God has given to him to be the Lord of the heavens and the earth, to be the, the judge on that great white throne, to rule over the affairs of men from the right hand of the Father himself. And, and uh, he, is, he is certainly in a place that is unique and special in every possible way. He is God. But we are co-heirs with Christ. We are his brothers and his sisters. We are adopted as children. And that most assuredly has ramifications. We see at the end of Romans chapter 8, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Now let's just stop right there. Justifies. This is a judicial term. Justification. Justifies. This is a judicial decree of not guilty. And you say, well, how on earth can I be not guilty? Because Jesus paid it all. Because Jesus, the righteous judge, came down from his seat of judgment and, and wrote that check for your fine. Because Jesus, the Savior, went up on the cross and died a sinner's death and took all the sins of the world upon himself. It says, it is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Stop there. Yes, Christ was raised from the dead on the third day. Christ is God. He is the conqueror of death. He is the resurrected one. And he is the first fruit of many brothers in that sense too. Because after you die, when time is no more... God will raise us up in resurrection bodies that, that are permanent and incorruptible too. 
Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the key idea of adoption. Now, Paul was a Roman citizen. He was a legal scholar, trained under the best minds, uh, and, and absolutely one of the most brilliant men to ever walk the earth. And, and, you know, the Holy Spirit, of course, is inspiring Paul to write these words, but Paul uses a lot of legal terminology, both in Jewish law and in Roman law, to express himself. And he uses this, uh, I almost said metaphor, but it isn't a metaphor, this image of adoption very deliberately. The thing about adoption in Roman law was that it was largely used for inheritance. Now, there were a lot of adoptions in Jewish life and, uh, and in Roman life too, but frequently for different purposes. Uh, the the tendency in Jewish life was to adopt people into the covenant community, whereas the tendency in Roman life was to use uh, adoption as a means for inheritance. In Roman adoptions, the debts and family ties and legal existence of the adopted person simply ceased it was completely washed away. Whatever had gone before was no more. And they took on a completely new identity in the new family under the new adoptive father. Again, this was a useful tool in many cases uh, for, for inheritance. And so we see that exact language used here in Romans. And and deliberately so. But perhaps the bigger point is that in Roman adoption, the new son, who no longer had his old debts, all of that is washed away, no longer had uh, any of the legal encumbrances he might have had before. If he'd been a slave, he wasn't a slave anymore. Uh, if he was a debtor, he didn't, wasn't a debtor anymore. Uh, he was now an heir of his new father, uh, but more importantly, he could not be disinherited. A natural born child could be disinherited on the theory that, hey, you didn't know this person when you got him, you know, you just got the luck of the draw. Indeed, Roman fathers had the uh, legal authority to put their sons to death, but not adopted children. Adopted children were forever. It was a solemn ceremony. Indeed, it was a public ceremony because of the public ramifications of wiping out debts and you know, wiping out other legal obligations. It was a very big deal. And it was a big deal that was understood very, very well to those to whom Paul was writing. Note that I quoted that passage from the book of Romans which was literally sent to the church at Rome, the city of Rome, the seat of the empire, and, of course, the genesis of Roman law. So, so when we are talking about Christ's acts on our behalf, we are talking about the justification of the person, of you, I would hope, the justification, which means that all of your sins are washed away. And you need to understand, not 
all of your sins up to the moment at which you place your faith in Christ, listen closely, all of your sins, past, present, and future. Did I mention at the outset that God is beyond time? And let's be real here. Christ died on that cross 2,000 years ago. If it, if his crucifixion, if his shed blood, if his sacrifice was only good for sins up to a certain point in time, wouldn't do any good for you. No. This covering, this, this covering in the shed blood, this, this offering, this sacrifice, this atonement, this redemption is for your sinfulness. Remember a while ago we talked about breaking individual laws versus breaking the law as a whole. You know, your, your status not merely as having a, a parking ticket, but as, as a traitor. It, it, Christ's, Christ's atonement, Christ's redemption, Christ's justification wipes that all away. All of it. Not just what you have done, but what you will do. When someday you stand before the throne in judgment, what he's going to say to you is, not guilty. Now, does that mean you get to just sin all the time? No, and we're going to get to that. But it does not mean that the believer is under threat of judgment. For if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. And it is a permanent thing. Now, the catch there is a decent number of people will confess with their mouth, but not truly believe in their heart. There are definitely people who are kidding themselves about their salvation, and you might be one of them. So you should examine yourself very carefully. Am I actually a believer of Jesus Christ? Am I actually under his lordship? Do I actually serve him? Do I actually love him? Because a lot of people are going to discover on that final day that they weren't really who they said they were and maybe not even who they thought they were. The heart is deceitful in all its ways. There is a tremendous capacity in the human heart for self-deception. Don't be a fool. This is eternal in nature. These are eternal stakes we're talking about. But Christ will wash away not merely your sins, but your sinfulness. Not merely you know, your, your individual acts, but your status as a traitor. And make you a son or a daughter. It is unfathomably great. It is infinitely more than we could conceive of, more than we could ever, ever deserve. Hence the term grace. So that gets us to the final part, which is the, the living of this. What happens next? Now, now of course, uh, Christ has, has died on the cross and risen from the grave on the third day, just as he said, and just as the prophets foretold. And, and uh, he spent 40 days thereafter, uh, appearing to various people, including his disciples, on numerous occasions. At one point, more than 500 people in one place, and and uh, uh, this is all well attested to, even in Josephus. And and uh, after 40 days, he ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and um, and reigns there to this day. He is ruling now over the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth are. Um, not as they will be. The day will come when they're better. We see that at the end of Revelation. We, uh, we know that there will be a, a new heaven and a new earth, and we know that uh, the earth will be re-perfected, that it is currently subjected to frustration under the weight of sin, but it will be liberated from that bondage, as will we all. The day will come when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and we will all see him as he is 
and be like him as a result. Those who have uh, remained in their rebellion will be punished, but those who are redeemed will enjoy and live with him forever and ever. Amen. What will we do then? That's a different lecture than extremely basic Christianity. But uh, what are we going to do? We are going to live forever. We are going to live in perfected bodies. However you look at yourself today, uh, that's going away. It'll still be you, but it'll be an incorruptible you that you know doesn't get zits and you know doesn't have congestive heart failure and you know doesn't get old and you know doesn't go gray. It'll be you the way you should have been if there hadn't been sin. See, the whole world is a little bit broken because of sin. If, if God had not been merciful on us all, he would have just wiped it out and started over, I guess. But he didn't. He let it be just a little bit broken. And everything is broken. Everything is off. Nothing is quite right. But nothing is all the way wrong. Everything everything under heaven is subject to what we call common grace which is to say grace that is common to everybody and and so you know it rains on the just and the unjust you know bad people are able to eat and drink and enjoy their life too and and uh, everyone has an opportunity for uh, a, a lifetime to see the error of their ways and, and turn from them and do good in this world and live to do good in the next. We call the progressive getting better of a person sanctification, which is uh, to become saint-like, saint-like, sanctification. And, and it is not instant. Justification is instant. It is a ruling. Imagine the judge banging the gavel. It's done. You are not guilty by reason of Jesus. Uh, but sanctification is something that is in three parts, like the Trinity is in three parts, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Sanctification is in three parts. It is definitive, progressive, and final. Definitive sanctification, uh, God declares you saint-like at the moment of justification. Final sanctification is what you will be in the life to come. You'll actually be perfect. You'll actually be sinless. You'll actually live the way you ought to live. And, and we long for that, for sure. But progressive sanctification is from where you are to where you're going. This tricks people. This trips them up. This is where a lot of actual believing Christians struggle because they are, despite everything they mouth with their, uh, with their lips about believing that we are saved by grace through faith, and even that not of yourselves, even the, even the faith is the gift of God, not of works that no man should boast. You know, that's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Uh, Despite knowing those verses, despite understanding them, theoretically, a lot of Christians are, are burdened by their ongoing imperfections. And to be fair, it would be worth remembering that Paul struggled with that too. So he spends most of the you know first few chapters of the book of Romans uh, laying the, the groundwork for this case about uh, grace and works. And then he gets to uh, chapter 7, verse 7, and he says, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known what was sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Now, you think about that a second. What's he, what's he saying there? Uh, same thing as a lot of things that you probably did in college. You know, the joke is there's a time and place for everything, and it's called college. Uh, <laughs> there were probably things you had never imagined before some certain point in your life, and when you heard of them, all of a sudden you wanted to do them maybe because they were bad. And, and that's what Paul's saying here. I, I hadn't wanted to covet, and then I realized there was a commandment against it, and I started thinking about it, he says. Uh, 
It says, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. He's just saying, until you tell me something's wrong, I don't know. It says, I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. Yeah, you know, think about Eve in the garden. She, it would never have occurred to her not to eat a particular fruit until God said not to, and suddenly she wanted to. Oh, it says for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous and good. What's he saying? He's he's not saying the law is the problem. He's saying that the law caused him to become his own problem. He says, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. You ever felt that way? You ever looked around and just marveled, what am I doing? This isn't who I am. This isn't who I want to be. He says, now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, If I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. What's he saying? He's saying that even though your spirit has been made new. A new creation, Scripture calls it. Your body still has its old habits. Your your sinful flesh still has its desires and its passions. It still wants its own way. You aren't the fully remade person you will be when you get your resurrection body someday and your spirit and your body are in harmony. You are at war You're uh, with yourself. Your, your spirit is made new, but your flesh is still decaying, dying. He says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I still serve the law of sin. But there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. The works of the law can't save. Because it's just like if I gave you a glass of water and you took a thimble full of sewage and you dropped a single drop in the glass would you then drink the glass of water one sinful act one act of treason condemns you to death and hell just like one act by Benedict Arnold condemned him forevermore as a traitor and we're still talking about it two and a half centuries later. No, you can't save yourself and all of the good works you can do are not going to change your ledger. That's not how it works. But Christ redeems you utterly. And through Christ, you are adopted as the Father's son or daughter, the Savior's brother or sister, The law is given that sinners may know what is true 
and they are condemned by their treason against the lawgiver. But once you become a believer, do you see here in chapter 7 of Romans where Paul says, and since I can't get my act together, I'm surely condemned, I'm going to hell? No! Instead, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And here's why. You've listened all this time. Here's the punchline. The reason why is that when you're no longer a stranger and a criminal, but instead a child of the Father, the law ceases to be the instrument of your judgment and punishment and instead becomes the house rules. You are under the loving tutelage of a father who wants to make you better and better just like when you were five your parents wanted to make you better and better if you had normal good parents at least and and they put up with a lot of junk out of you and then you were eight and they put up with different junk out of you and then you were 14 and 16 and 17 and they put up with a lot more junk out of you but all of it was aimed at shaping you into the young adult that you were to become to raise up a child in the way that he should go, that when he's older, he may not depart far from it. That's what we call sanctification. You aren't under the condemnation of the law because Jesus paid it all. You are under the house rules of a loving father. And he's not an eternal or heavenly mother, so he's not super lenient in the way mom sometimes is, but he is loving. He's just, he's firm, he's strong, but he loved us so much that while we were yet in sin, he sent his only begotten son to die for us, and nothing will separate us from him. So, sanctification, becoming saint-like, is a process in a family. You can get in trouble with your dad, but at least your heavenly father and probably your earthly father aren't going to kick you out of the house for it, aren't going to put you to death for it. Those who are outside the family are in a different class, just like they are in, in our lives. You know, some stranger who commits some transgression against us, we treat that differently than we do our own children. Our own children, we correct and nurture and improve. The Lord himself says that those uh, he, he does not chastise uh, are, are not his, but he chastises his own as sons. Why? Not for punishment. Not for judgment. Judgment is over. Judgment was meted out on the cross. You will stand before the great white throne and be pronounced not guilty if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So the many Christians who are still trying desperately to be justified by their works have totally missed the boat. You were justified by accepting Jesus Christ in the first place and his substitutionary atonement. And you are sanctified now by virtue of the Father teaching you and nourishing you and nurturing you and giving you those things that you need to become a mature believer and a mature son or daughter to whom he says, well done. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to do so today, not tomorrow. There may not be a tomorrow. There may not be a tomorrow for you, even if there's a tomorrow for me. You do not know the day and the hour of his coming, and you do not know the day and the hour of your death. There is no opportunity beyond the grave, so you better get right now. Don't put it off. 
today is the day. What you need to do is very simple. You need to, to acknowledge to the Lord himself that you are a sinner, that you are sorry for your sin, that you repent of it. Repent means change, not just not just confess, not just not just apologize, but actually start the process of changing. You may not actually be able to change completely. In fact, I guarantee you will not be able to change everything you're doing flawlessly, but it does not matter. It matters the intent of your heart because what did the disciples ask Jesus about forgiveness? They said, hey, if someone asks forgiveness of me, you know, how many times should I actually put up with that and forgive him? You know, and, and you know, in, in the interest of being extreme, they say, uh, up to seven times? And Jesus says, no, that's nowhere near enough. Try 70 times seven. Now, if Jesus holds us to that standard with regard to each other, how much more does he hold himself to the same? He will pick you up and dust you off and kiss your scraped boo-boo and set you back on your feet to try, try again. There is immense love and cherishing from the Father to his children. Acknowledge him as Lord. Acknowledge your state as a sinful traitor. Repent of it. Ask forgiveness and begin the process of change and turn your life over to him. Place your faith and trust in him. Believe on him as God, as Lord, as creator, as king, as savior who died for your sins and took them all away, but only if you accept that payment as your own. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is Rod Martin talking about extremely basic Christianity, the most wonderful thing in this world and that you will ever know.